Good evening and welcome to the 2020 Newnham Conversation. Thank you so much for joining us this evening as part of the first Cambridge University Online Alumni Festival. I'm Alison Rose and I've been Principal of Newnham College since September 29, 2019, joining after a career in the civil service and as a diplomat ending as British Ambassador to Belgium. Joining us this evening for our 12th Newnham Conversation are two eminent philosophers. The first, who is no stranger to the Newnham Conversations, is Professor Honora O'Neill, who combines writing on political philosophy and ethics with an enormous range of public activities. And of course, is well known and beloved by Newnhamites as one of my predecessors as principal of Newnham College from 1992 to 2006. She was also president of the British Academy from 2005 to 2009 and has been a crossbench member of the House of Lords since 2000. She lectures and writes on justice and ethics, accountability and trust, justice and borders, as well as the future of universities, the quality of legislation and the ethics of communication. In conversation with Honora this evening will be Professor Ray Langton, the Knightsbridge Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge and a fellow at Newnham College. Born and raised in India, Ray has taught philosophy in Australia, the US and the UK. She works in moral and political philosophy, speech act theory, philosophy of law, the history of philosophy, metaphysics and feminist philosophy. She was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2003, to the British Academy in 2014 and to the Academia Europea in 2017. And in 2014, she featured on Prospect Magazine's voted list of 50 world thinkers 2014, chosen for, I quote, engaging most originally and profoundly with the central questions of the world today. So I'm hugely grateful to both of them for joining us this evening to discuss the topic of democracy and digital technologies. Anora, over to you to open the conversation for this evening. Uh, thank you, Alison, and uh, thank you, Rave, uh, for uh, being here to uh, prod me in a philosophical way when I go wrong. Um, I had actually thought that Ray was going to start out, but that doesn't matter because I will uh, lay out my first thought and then, Ray, perhaps you can respond. My first thought is that it's very remarkable that a decade ago, everybody thought that the digital revolution would be fantastic for democracy. And I'm asking myself the question, why did they think that? And I think that the answer is people thought, well, it gives us wonderful connectivity, unparalleled connectivity. It allows us to reach more people further away and so on. But my overall conclusion is, unfortunately, that's very distracting if what you're, you care about is democracy. Because for democracy, you need a lot of other things. Connectivity is great, but it can be used just as actively for misinforming or disinforming or silencing as it can be for giving people reasonable evidence or uh, checking things out. So. Um, the, the fantasy world of, in which connectivity is all, I suppose I first noticed it when the Arab Spring began and people were saying, isn't this wonderful? We shall have democracy throughout the Arab world all too soon. Well, as we sadly know, that is not at all what happened. And I think that that is actually fairly typical. Now we are all older and wiser. Well, I'm certainly older, um, but I may not be wiser. Uh, but it strikes me that the promise of those early days has absolutely failed us. And I think that the interesting thing to try to work out now is why hasn't it worked? What went wrong? What didn't work the way we thought it was going to work? Ray, maybe you'd like to comment at this point. Well, one thing someone might ask is, Maybe it's a matter of bad luck that it didn't work for the Arab Spring. Maybe it could have worked fantastically. Maybe there were other factors that had nothing to do with technology that squashed it. 
perhaps there's plenty of promise there if only we uh, think a bit differently or if only we have some different um, norms and constraints. Um, I mean, the Arabs bring at least points to a certain kind of potential there, don't you think? Uh, yes, I do. But I think that what many of us were missing at that point is that communication works when we have the right sorts of intermediaries. Uh, the sort, and the old intermediaries uh, uh, established, I suppose, since the advent of printing for the most part, but also uh, broadcasting, uh, they were, uh, if you like, moderating influences. So you think of editors, you think of uh, people who uh, uh, look at the uh, copy and check it, you think of uh, librarians, you think of people who are the intermediaries between us and the sources of information. And uh, of course, sometimes they've been beholden to the powers that be, or the powers that were. Sometimes they've been beholden to uh, governments and they have uh, been vehicles for censorship. But on the whole, and by and large, and certainly in the democracies, the old intermediaries produced information that was useful to members of the public and uh, that uh, indicated how you could check it out, what was um, going to be uh, the way to tell whether this information was reliable. However, what the connectivity revolution did was to sweep the old intermediaries away. Uh, one can see a lot of evidence of this, uh, not, and indeed there are a number of books on it, but one can see how extraordinarily different it is uh, when you have unmediated communication. But is it unmediated? Is it the case that the new technologies give us unmediated information? And I think that it is in fact not the case. But who are the new intermediaries? The new intermediaries aren't um, your local newspaper editor uh, or uh, the person who uh, reads the manuscripts for Cambridge University Press and writes a careful opinion. The new intermediaries are, of course, the tech companies. And the tech companies have a very different view of what it is to be an intermediary. And among other things, they largely keep hidden who are the paymasters, who is in control. Uh, let me hand over to you now, Ray, because I'm sure this is something you've thought about a lot too. Well, when you first started talking about intermediaries, um, you introduced the idea of a kind of intervention on the part of an editor or on the part of uh, a journalist or somebody who was um, answerable or was um, wanting to um, communicate in ways that had certain goals. Now, some people might, might have thought, um, why does democracy need that? You mentioned that uh, the intermediaries that we used to have could be um, tools of abuse um, and tools of you know greater powers of oppression but what if um, what if the intermediaries what, sorry the intermediaries might sound as though they are interfering with what other people might say so obviously there's a kind of there's one kind of picture of free speech where free speech is a kind of free for all so the free speech is a free for all is actually going to be interfered with if you have the intermediaries. It sounds like you don't like that idea um, of free speech as a free for all because it, the intermediaries are doing a good job and that's a, something that we need. Could you explain that a bit more? Well, I don't think the intermediaries do a perfect job and certainly in uh, certain regimes, they do uh, the job they do is called censorship. Mm -hmm. And that, that's it, uh, the intermediaries is it, at its worst. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the idea that without any intermediaries, all will be fine, uh, is, I think, a charming fantasy. That is to say, if we could all uh, uh, be a, in one conversation, like round a dinner table, say, there we are in one global conversation. Unfortunately, there are a lot of us and some of us shout loudly and some of us uh, know things and some of us don't know things. So 
it doesn't end up as a very good conversation. Uh, and I think that when you look at the ethics of communication across the centuries, you realize there's a great deal to it other than uh, freedom of speech, or as we say, and I think it's a rather telling phrase nowadays, freedom of expression. It is only the freedom of the speaker or writer or uh, the person on the keyboard that we're concerned about, and not what it gives the, the, the reader, listener, and viewer. And I think it, in thinking about free speech, I would prefer to think about uh, the, the necessary conditions for uh, adequate communication and just giving the speaker, the originator, the freedom to express him or herself seems to me far from enough. Thank you. So you've brought in something really interesting and important, which is the distinction between thinking of free speech as a matter of the speaker and thinking of it as a matter of the hearer. Um, and you've also talked a lot about communication, which is, of course, a two way process. Yes. And um, why do we why should we think of it in terms of the hearer more than the speaker? I mean, why sh shouldn't we? Ha what's wrong exactly with the uh, say whatever you like to whatever you like to whomever you want um, and anything goes. What exactly is wrong with that picture? You mentioned information, you mentioned some voices being bigger than others and some voices drowning out others. Well, that was implicit in what you said about silencing earlier. Um, but um, why, um, why is it the job of communication to um, why should we be focusing on the hearer? And why does that matter for democracy? I don't think we should focus only on the hearer. We should also focus on the speaker. Uh, we should focus on the reader as well as the writer. Mm -hmm. So she, uh, both the originator and the recipient matter in my view. But on the other hand, uh, our danger now is that we focus only on uh, the originator, the speaker, the writer, the broadcaster, and don't uh, look at the needs of the uh, reader, listener, viewer, the, the recipient. And I think the recipient matters because if the recipient can't assess what he or she hears, reads, sees, uh, then uh, of course uh, it's very, very difficult for the recipient to tell uh, it, was this information or fantasy? Was it misinformation or was it perhaps disinformation? And I think it's no accident that uh, we have uh, far more experience of disinformation uh, than we used to have. Disinformation uh, is not a new word and it used to be something that people thought uh, uh, propaganda machines in totalitarian regimes did, but now it's, uh, so to speak, uh, been democratized, and I say that for, uh, slightly naughtily because mm -hmm. I don't really approve of it being democratized, mm -hmm. but the idea that you can influence an election in another country mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, means that we now realize essentially by uh, targeting the voters in other country with selective messages seems to me to be very corrupting of democracy. Mm -hmm. And we uh, know from the little we know, and it wasn't as fully developed then of the previous election in the United States, mm -hmm. where Hillary Clinton uh, was being uh, presented as running, I mean, it's almost comic when you say it, but a pedophile enterprise from a pizza shop in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. Uh, but it had very serious consequences because a chap went and shot up the pizza shop. Um, and uh, it is that sort of uh, fantasy that it's only freedom of expression that matters, that seems to me to get us into trouble. Freedom of expression matters, but there are a whole lot of other standards that matter for communication that works, all the way from civility to accuracy to honesty and so on. That's great, thank you. But. Um... You mentioned now disinformation and conspiracy theories, and you mentioned uh, a, an egregious example of that. Does that really um, does that really come down to a problem with digital technologies? I mean, we've had you know 
are rumors and disinformation and propaganda and conspiracy theories around for a long time. Is it just that the digital platforms exacerbate it in your view or that they is it is it to do with this absence of the intermediary that you talked about or wh why why exactly is this a digital issue i think that uh, the, uh, basically the problem is that in order to judge the um what we hear or what we read or, uh, we ne need usually to have some view of where it's coming from mm -hmm. And if it's your local newspaper, take the Cambridge Evening News. If it's your local newspaper, you sort of know that they won't uh, rush a conspiracy theory at you. At least I think I know. Uh, it has, of course, changed since Alan Rusbridger was a cub reporter on the Cambridge Evening News. Uh, but I think that that is one of the uh, deep changes in our lives, that we are receiving... Uh, what purports to be information, but may be misinformation or disinformation from sources that we can't identify. And in my view, the, the, the big problem here is the anonymity of the people who are in control. You don't know who is producing the content that uh, you are encountering when you're online. Mm -hmm. So is anonymity a is anonymity a problem because you um, don't know whether, because you have no grounds for trusting it? Um, or is anonymity a problem because there's no one taking responsibility? Um, or is anonymity a problem because it's somehow, you know, we've left behind the picture of ordinary people chatting to each other around the table that you began with. Why exactly is anonymity a problem? I don't think it's always a problem. Uh, that is to say, if I think about uh, news reporters in uh, dictatorial regimes, uh, yeah. or brutal regimes, uh, they do need anonymity. Uh, where I object is when anonymity is afforded to the powerful, to the people who are actually orchestrating uh, the uh, uh, information that others receive. I, so I, I, I'm for anonymity when it has uh, a clear purpose, but not for um, uh, people who are trying to control other people's thoughts. I mean, are you, are you interested? There are two things. The, the, one, is, one is the possibility of, you know, dark forces controlling elections through, um, through the abuse of certain, you know, online um, um, data mining and the manipulative kind of things that we've been doing. Um, but there's also the thing that you started with, which is about, um, it's about not caring about whether it's true or not, and not needing to care about whether it's true or not, because it's just a matter of, um, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of, I mean, maybe you're not even in the business of talking, maybe of, of you know, proper communication. You're just saying something to make a splash, to, um, to get, a, the, the point of digital speech is, maybe it's not about information. Maybe it's not, maybe it's about, um, you know, uh, getting a lot of likes. That's nothing to do with dark forces. It's about um, the, the switching of the use of certain sorts of, if we call it communication. So it's not about um, talking to each other about, well, I mean, information is not the right um, word to use for <laughs> posts on social media that are designed to get lots of people looking at you and uh, uh, lots of likes, lots of viewers. Um, there, the, uh, the currency is not about information or knowledge, it's about attention. And it doesn't really matter. Isn't that part of the issue? It's nothing about dark forces. It's about a different kind of norm governing the exchange. I think that's perfectly reasonable where that is the norm that's appropriate. So that, for example, if, if I'm uh, trying to organize a, 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 a play or a wonderful uh, fashion show, I may be much more concerned about getting the eyeballs, as they say, uh, than I am about uh, the information that is being conveyed. But I think that we uh, perhaps need to look a bit more at the politics of this too. Okay. Uh, after all, the, uh, the print world, that old fashioned world that most of us grew up in, uh, was once without 
many controls. But mm -hmm. over the years, we have uh, uh, elaborated legislation so that when you buy a book, you open it up and there is what we call an imprint. Or when you see a print advertisement, there is an imprint. You know who produced it. If you wanted, if you needed, you could check. And uh, there would be uh, problems if uh, uh, there was, uh, for example, a violation of truth in advertising laws, or if there was a violation of uh, providing um, harmful misinformation to, to people. Uh, so the imprint gives you checkability. We don't have that in the online world. But in some ways we don't have that we, even before the online world, there were limits to the amount of checkability. So, I mean, there are obviously there are, you know, famous pieces of um, propaganda like Mein Kampf, which, uh, which, which long predate uh, the digital era and yet which did their work by named authors, a named author. Um, and uh, with a particular press. And you might be right that it's about the inability to check, but in that case, the inability to check has a, has a kind of different source. Um, so I wonder, um, I mean, so I'm wondering um, what, he, I'm trying to pinpoint what the digital uh, shift has changed. Um, yes, and, and I think it's not one thing, but it is that it has, as it were, go back to connectivity. Mm -hmm. If you, um, connectivity enables you to distribute things in a way that never was possible in the pre, uh, in the world of the older communication technologies. Mm -hmm. You couldn't uh, uh, micro-target people far away. You couldn't uh, produce anonymous um, uh, I've got a message from Penny Hubbard on my screen. <laughs> Somebody thinks speed has a lot to do with it. Yes, I agree. Speed has a lot to, to do with it. Uh, the number of different uh, standards that can be uh, observed or violated, it, it's rather slow motion. That old world of print indeed the more recent world of broadcasting, it has an organization, a structure, an accountability, which is far from perfect, but it does allow people to say, no, that was a, a malicious intervention in this particular editorial process. Of course, when you get a, 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 a dictatorship, go back to Mein Kampf, Mein Kampf was a bestseller in its day. On the other hand, it didn't appear daily on your breakfast table and your telephone. Ah, excuse me, I'm on a, a lecture at the moment. <laughs> Something happened at my end. <laughs> That's okay. So, um, in the background here are some bigger pictures about um, the point of communication and the, the point of speech and whether the point of speech is communication and what the point of all that is in a democracy. So um, um, you've mentioned, you know, the sinister forces that um, undermine the vote by spreading disinformation. How exactly does that um, undermine democracy? I think that uh, if people uh, find it too difficult to uh, check where the information that, on which they're relying is coming from, it gets very hard for people because why shouldn't I believe something that seems to me rather nice? Uh, for example, suppose I'm a young mum and I think about having the children vaccinated. And then I decide, well, uh, that's not very nice. It means uh, give, giving the children a, a jab and then they don't feel very well for an evening. And I might really think, seriously think, that vaccination is a bad idea. Now, uh, I've been very struck that in third world countries where polio until recently was rife, people would carry their children through the day and through the night in order to get them vaccinated because they still knew what polio was. 
we've moved into a world where very few, you have to be as old as me to know what polio was. And uh, so we don't take it seriously. Now, that's the sort of thing that's something that is in, uh, perhaps on the surface just an alternative view suddenly becomes really rather harmful. So that's an example where there's the, it seems to be a tremendous irony that the that it seems as though having access to to the digital resources seem, is um, destroying or undermining certain sorts of knowledge. Um, it's not just access to the resources; it's yeah. access to the people who are determinedly destroying that knowledge. That's right. So yeah. this, so you, now we've raised the topic of knowledge, and um, mm. so uh, is the um, problem that concerns you, uh, is it about knowledge or is it about ethics and how do these epistemic issues, the issues about knowledge, how do they connect with the um, um, ethical issues because you think there's, there are ethical norms that govern communication. Can you tease these apart and tell us a bit more about your perspective on how they connect up? I, th I think the ethical and epistemic norms uh, and there are some norms like, uh, for example, trustworthiness or attentiveness, where you'd be hard put to say, is it a more matter of knowledge or is it more a matter of ethics? It's a matter of both, I think. And uh, so being I able to judge... Trust. Sorry? That's, that's norms about trust. Is well, uh, trustworthiness, I think, is, is, is both uh, ethical and epistemic. That's to say, I, I want to place my trust in the trustworthy, and that's quite a complicated judgment occasionally. I have to check whether people are competent, whether they're honest, whether they're pretty reliable. Uh, but it can be done when we all are used to doing it. Most of the time we can't do that, though. I mean, we rely on structures to to do the um, checking for us. I mean, doesn't that get back to what you said before about having institutions that are the intermediaries which, which make things trustworthy? Because we, don't we just trust each other and trust what we read and trust what we see just by default without checking? We often do, but we live in a structure where we're probably able to uh, make a rough and ready judgment about who's trustworthy and who's not. I, uh, an example I've used quite often is the very well-named Mr. Madoff, who made off with lots of people's money. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, people, would it have been good if more people had trusted him just, just on hunch? No, it would have been rather bad if more yeah. people even more people have trusted yeah. him. And uh, placing trust well is difficult. I don't think uh, it was ever easy, by the way, but it was surely easier when, uh, as it were, most of the things you had to trust were in your town or in your village. And people would know, oh, Jones, uh, he's always telling tall stories and you would know what the general view was and perhaps you would rely on it. You might be mistaken, but still you could do it. Now you're getting all sorts of things all the time online and it is quite difficult to judge which of them are trustworthy and which not. Can I just step back a bit and, and ask what the trusting um, and what the knowledge that we get by trusting trustworthy sources. Can I just step back and ask, um, what is the role of this in a democracy? I mean, is it that we need this in order for um, uh, communication to, be, to achieve its point, for free speech to achieve its point? Do we need it in order for votes to be informed and therefore to be proper choices? What is it? I mean, in one, so knowledge has got different knowledge has got sort of different roles, doesn't it? And um, both Onora and I, um, in some of our work, we work on Kant. And I don't know what Onora thinks of this bit of Kant, but uh, Immanuel Kant had the idea that um, when your choice was based on a lie or when your choice was based on a falsehood, if you don't know what you're doing because you're deceived, there's a sense in which you're not really doing it. 
Now that's a familiar idea and we've come across that idea, we come across that idea in medical ethics and I know Onora has written on this as well. It's in the idea that when you are, if the, if the doctor has told you a pack of lies, which of course doesn't happen anyway, but if the doctor has told you a pack of lies uh, in the small print and you sort of go into the procedure thinking that you're going to have a, uh, a, a small um, biopsy and instead you come out with an amputation and you just didn't uh, you didn't know what was so and the doctor says well look you signed on the dotted line you made your choice you know your instinct is to say wait a minute that's not a choice that's not a choice if you were if if you were lying to me so that's a very familiar idea that we need knowledge in order to choose properly. Now, if you take that over into the context of a demo of democratic choice, the most obvious case being uh, a vote, then you know a vote where you don't know what it is you're voting for isn't really a vote. Um, so that, that's, um, that's unfortunately it I'm is. <laughs> Okay, it is. You it put is the X a vote. in the box. It is a vote. It has um, to. It has to count as a vote, obviously. But if yeah. we get back to the um, to the the principles behind a vote, which is uh, when you vote, you are choosing who to govern you, um, and choices need knowledge. That is the thought that I'm getting from Kant, and I don't know whether you agree with this bit of of Kant. Kant was Kant said you know, uh, in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, that when, if you make a lying promise to someone, uh, yes, I'll give you back your money uh, next Tuesday, and you have no intention of giving back your money next Tuesday. So you give them, so the, the, so the friend gives the money, the friend thinks they're lending the money, and really they're giving the money. So there's a sense in which not knowing what you're doing um, uh, stops you doing the thing that you were choosing. So, so that's why you have this connection between knowledge and choice. Is that the key to the significance of this for democracy? It seems to me that you think the significance is wider than that, but is that one part of it? I think it's one part of it, yes. Um, but uh, a vote is a very, uh, in one sense, a very simple choice. Uh, because we usually don't get many options. But on the other hand, the judgments that lie behind choosing to vote this way or that way are multiple, complex, and perhaps uh, not always uh, very clear. Uh, so voting involves other things than knowledge, I think. It, inv it certainly involves um, uh, judgments about the competence, uh, the uh, program, uh, the person you're supposedly electing and so on. Voting is uh, multiply complex and uh, in that way it may not be absolutely the most typical case of a choice, although it's fundamental for democratic institutions. But on the other hand, I think we do recognize that if you completely muddy the waters and make it very hard for people to tell uh, what they're choosing between, then at a certain point, it's difficult to see that democracy can work well. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that um, there will be cases where voting for someone will be a bit like signing the consent form uh, in where there's been a lie in the background. So I, I'm going to show my colours here and, and say I think the Brexit bus was, uh, was a bit like, was a, I think it was... It's a, it was probably a big lie um, and uh, it wasn't a piece of digital technology, so it's a bad example for our debate, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's an example of, of a certain kind of falsehood that informs choice. Um, and the conspiracy theories you talked about as well, uh, about Hillary Clinton, they inform people's choices. Um, yes. and, and, uh, and in a certain sense, stop them being so fully a choice. So in that sense, I would say democracy is being undermined. Well, it's a misinformed choice at a certain point, isn't yeah. it? Uh, mm -hmm. Something you said about consent there uh, uh, strikes me as very important. Mm -hmm. uh, people say, oh, well, providing you've consented, that's all right. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know when we go online, mm -hmm. uh, you're asked, for example, will you accept cookies? 
Mm. Well, if you don't accept them, you won't get whatever it was. And most people don't know what that particular set of cookies will do. Mm. Uh, so all the time, and I fear uh, even in uh, more traditional things like uh, medical procedure, we have uh, very um, debased notions of consent. Mm. Now, if the doctor comes towards me with a syringe and says, I do need to take some blood and I say, I will have my arm, um, uh, that, it seems to me, is fairly clearly informed choice. Mm. But on the other hand, a great deal of what's going on is what I would call tick and click consent. It isn't mm. real consent at all. It wasn't informed. You've got, got uh, uh, two options. You didn't really get the opportunity to understand either. And yeah. my um, worry is that what has gone on in medical ethics has suggested that we can subject all sorts of things to consent procedures um, which are probably too complex and I don't mean that, that uh, we get it wrong in daily life because uh, the process for consenting to something like an amputation is actually, a, uh, if it's not an emergency, a very serious process. There's plenty of good consent in the medical world but the idea that we can subject everything to consent procedures seems to me an illusion. Yeah. The other, and I think what you've just said brings out a really important asymmetry between the um, digital communication you've been talking about and the medical case, because the key thing in the medical case is there are these very important um, human um, uh, social institutions and relationships. And, uh, and it's part of that that very often we won't be able to know everything and the doctors won't be able to know everything and we're often working with the doctors to um to um to rely on them and to trust them um for um the parts that we don't know about and can't know about um and so i i think that it is a different case and i, I sort of want to take back in some ways some of what i said before that um but in the case of um in the case of the kinds of communication you've been describing, the online communications, we haven't got that kind of um, social and human institution that involves trusting relationships between people, between patients and doctors, and, um, and with the very complex epistemic situation that we have there. Um, I've been thinking about this more because um, 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 uh, colleagues and uh, close then colleagues Richard Holton and um, Zoe Fritz um, uh, have been thinking hard about the issues of um, trust in the medical uh, context and I, it does seem quite different where we need to depend on each other in these ways. Now obviously we need to depend on each other epistemically all over the place in the medical context, in the media um, uh, and uh, online as well. What do you think are the solutions um, to the, some of the problems that you've been talking about? If we can put forward, if we can move to the topic of, you know, how can we, how can we fix some of the problems that you've been uh, raising? I mean, do we need to treat the digital world in ways that are comparable to other bits of the commercial world where people are making a profit out of what other people are doing? Or what, what's the key? I think it's very, very difficult, but I suspect the, the ball is beginning to roll. That is to say, if one reads all the current discussions about the need for regulation of the online world, you wouldn't have seen these discussions a few years ago. People were sure that, as I started out saying, connectivity was what we needed um, and that it would be a, a sheer benefit. I think people now realize it hasn't proved sheer benefit and they're trying to see what forms of regulation are a feasible and b effective and of course they've got to protect freedom of speech we are none of us going to uh, regard that as trivial uh, but at the same time uh, i think we have to know who is orchestrating it and i come back to saying that i think it's uh, quite important uh, not to afford anonymity to the very powerful, uh, for example, the tech companies, you don't know who is purchasing what sort of online uh, content to be distributed to whom. 
Uh, if you look, compare that with the regulation we have, I, I think it's now pathetically inadequate regulation of uh, electoral process in the UK, one begins to see how great the gulf is in that the electoral process doesn't permit, um, it, it largely works by control of expenditure so that party political expenditure on behalf of a candidate during an election campaign is wonderfully tightly regulated in the UK. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, non-party political expenditure, for example, expenditure by uh, a foreign power or by a rich uh, businessman is not recorded at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one factor, having the, the powerful dark figures in the shadows who aren't recorded at all. Another exactly. factor is anonymity. That, yeah. anonymity is one thing, but can I just add, throw in there that something else we mentioned before, which is the, the economy of attention rather than yes. the economy of knowledge. If you can get, um, if you can, if you can get everything you need without money, simply by making it attention getting, so it'll just drive through and get, um, and get propagated by, um, by people and machines and online machines that are harnessing the economics of attention, then you don't, need to it doesn't need to come up in anyone's um, account bill at all account account well, yes except we should remember that a lot of uh, you said the economy of attention mm. a lot of it is paid for and if you ask uh, what is an influencer a word that i didn't know until a couple of years ago uh, if you think about an influencer it isn't something that is done with no financial objective in mind what I meant, I think I completely appreciate that, but what I meant was if you manage to um, say something that is attention getting and mm. it costs you five pounds to say it, that's the only expense you need to put down. But meanwhile, if it's so attention getting that it cut, that it reaches two million people, um, you, got, yeah. you got the advertising budget of a, you know, of a huge company. So that's what I meant by the harnessing of attention um, and how that's not going to show up in the, um, in the economics of the situation. No, it, it isn't. Although uh, uh, one notices that a lot of people are managing to monetize that's the attention true. they get. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, good. Mm. Now might be a good time because we've got lots of really good questions. So if I may, Ray and Nora, I'll start to bring uh, the questions into the conversation. So cool. Terry Apter, who's a former senior tutor here at Newnham, has said, can you comment on the brevity and declamation that's encouraged by digital platforms? That seems to play a part in degrading communication because there's no room for nuance or reflection or correction. And also hostility can seem to generate more noise and more heat and therefore present dangerous incentives for the intermediaries. Would yeah. like to have a go at commenting on that? I think brevity is a feature of this and also the fact that, uh, uh, go back to the anonymity, that you can uh, say things that you wouldn't really want to say in your own person, you wouldn't want to have attributed to you. Uh, it's easy to put material out there if it's not going to come back to haunt you. So that's right. So the anonymity uh, affects it. Um, and then, um, Terry, the, the other thing is, um, it's, there's a sense in which it's not fully answerable when you put it out there. The, the, the brief, um, the brief um, declaration, you're putting, someone's putting it out there and then the people who are reading it are sort of maybe looking at it, maybe consuming it, maybe answering it, but, but most of the times it's not a normal conversational situation. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, for any philosopher of language, the communicative situation is very different to the ones that we normally talk about. Um, and I completely agree with you about the hostility. That also connects with the attention getting. Sorry, that wasn't a complete answer, but um, that's a great question. Thanks, Terry. And then Valerie Rees, who's one of the friends of Newnham, has said, David Allen Green, the eminent constitutional lawyer, has commented that when our leaders lie to us, 
the problem is that people don't mind being lied to, mm. which she thinks is an issue in the USA and the UK. Do you agree with David? Unfortunately, I do. I so, mean, the situation is unfortunate. What he says is correct. <laughs> so I think that um, there are a couple of, yeah, that's right, because one, what do you want the, what do you want the speech to do? One issue concerns sort of group identity. You want the speech, the speaker to say something that's going to make you think, yay, my team. So it's going to be about my team, the Republicans or the Democrats or whoever it is. Um, and that needn't be, that needn't be anything to do with um, anything that abides by epistemic norms at all. Um, and it, it also, um, um, I mean, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to, I hope this isn't lowering the tone, but there, there's a, a philosopher called Harry Frankfurt who wrote an essay uh, that then became a best-selling book, uh, and the essay and the book's name was Bullshit. And Harry Frankfurt, a philosopher, um, introduced the idea of bullshit in a, as distinct from lies. He said that the bullshitter is even worse than the liar. The liar keeps track of the truth and wants to deceive you and, um, and will um, uh, tell you the thing that they know to be false. Whereas the bullshitter doesn't uh, keep track of the truth at all. Uh, th th sorry, they're, they're not interested in that. They just care about something else. And so maybe one issue about the digital world and, especially, and about the politicians that are being described is that um, you win by by you win by means of a certain kind of bullshit, a certain kind of yay my team bullshit, um, which has got nothing to do with um, the point of communication and the point of free speech. Um, anyway, so that's a great question, and then and, and uh, that's a very good <laughs> comment on it too. <laughs> okay, sorry. I hope I didn't lower the tone too much. No, no, it, it, it really deserves to be lowered. A really good distinction, I think, to okay. make. So Pam Alexander, who's a Nina Monterey associate, has said, and she teaches us a lot of thinking about the community, that one of the few benefits of the last six months has been greater community awareness and coherence. And certainly for practical purposes, many new intermediaries are using digital technologies uh, to enable online conversations. Mm. Um, how could we perhaps ensure intermediaries at the local level um, engage people more in places they care for and perhaps build up a sense of trusted intermediaries there. Yeah. Who's going to have a go at that? It, Do you want to go, Nora? I'm not sure that it's such a difficult question, but at the local level, in a sense, um, uh, if it's local, there's a way in which the whole um, problem that has been created by online communication isn't there. You know who the other parties are. They're local, they're your neighbours, they're your friends, maybe you get to know more of them and so on. So uh, this, by the way, is uh, in no way do I want to criticise the use of social media by people to keep in touch with friends and family. That's wonderful. Uh, but of course that is not what the system is about. The system is about monetizing uh, the way in which people keep in touch with friends and families by using the data so gathered to distribute content. Uh, now, uh, at that point, you're looking at the new intermediaries, uh, the people who purchase and people who sell and people who control advertising, and it may not be advertising for nice products. I think this is a yeah that's I think this is a great question and and it it shows that we you know need to think more about um about the I mean obviously incredibly positive potential of uh, of the digital uh, resources that we have for building community um and uh, and in some ways it it's so horrible the idea that that that, that could get um harnessed so I actually I'm thinking of um prior to the um prior to the referendum um i think online communities that were interested in particular topics so for instance football that were really i mean i don't know whether they were anonymous or not but it, they were certainly communities of people who got on with each other and and it was a social um it was a it was you know completely um uh, 
terrific sort of social group, but they, but once the, um, the digital, um, th those who are, once the data from those, all of those all conversations online between ordinary people, once the data from that's harvested and you find out, oh, these are, these are the sort of people who actually, they love, they, they're not that happy about, about immigrants, but they are happy about this, that, and the other, and you find out uh, what they're happy about and what they're unhappy about, and then you have the targeted advertising at those people. That's the sinister part that I think Honora's um, bothered about. So that's a horrible irony that the um, that the, um, the the desire for community sort of gets um, um, gets exploited. Uh, I shouldn't go on. Sorry. Thanks. Do, do you think that, that uh, I mean, social media, it seems to me, uh, if, if it were, if, if only, if on, if it were only social media, it's fantastic. But of course, it isn't because, uh, as they say, you're not paying for it. You are the product. Your data are what it's done for and your data are then used for other things. My apologies for having a dog in the room. <laughs> Very good, very good. Well, it's a very good question from California here, which again highlights the, one of the few advantages of doing this online rather than having these two wonderful people in the room with us. But it does mean people from California can join us. So Caroline Godkin asks, is there an asymmetry where high quality sources of information, and she cites New York Times, sit behind paywalls, whereas low quality content of conspiracy type theories are free to access. Is there more that we can do to consider information a public good and fund through alternative means? And of course, this has been a very live conversation in the UK when there's some people are saying BBC Digital has a big advantage uh, because it's funded from the license, but other people would say, but yes, that does mean that there is some quality public good free material there. So what's your views on that? I th sorry, I think this is a great question because it, it brings up the idea that free speech is not the same as cheap speech. And um, this is hugely important. And so how are we, th there are much wider issues about the economics of, of the media um, and um, the, uh, and having lots of fact checkers is really expensive. Um, and of course, uh, bullshit is really cheap. Um, so, uh, the uh, and the, and that does br um, focus our attention on a really serious issue about about democracy because if democracy requires access to certain sorts of knowledge as we've been saying and if the and if the sort of knowledge that um honora has been talking about is uh is has the um the intermediation if you like um uh, of a, if it needs that kind of thing and that's expensive, there's a question of, about uh, how we get that. Uh, what does a democracy need and who funds what, uh, how do we resource what democracy needs? I think that is a really great and fundamental question about free speech. What sort of, what, pick, what sort of communication do we need? Um, and that means what sorts of intermediaries do we need? Because as you say, it doesn't come cheap. And I have found looking at the Authors Copyright and Licensing Society's statistics on the plunge in how much uh, writers earn or artists earn pretty uh, uh, discouraging. Uh, and of course, we know there are many, many fewer professional journalists than there used to be because uh, what's going on now, uh, let's call it kindly inventing stuff, is cheaper. I'm getting so many good questions. I'm trying frantically to squeeze as many into the last five minutes, but I think this one has to come as we're sitting in a university. Uh, and it's about, it's from Neve Tamalti, who's one of our fellows here. It's about the availability of high quality research. Is one answer, and it's potentially an excellent argument in favor of open research across all disciplines and a much more focused approach by universities and by researchers to public engagement. Mm. I, I find myself very torn in this area because on the one hand uh, one imagines that open access publication is a fantastic thing and now we know that a great deal of academic publication and research publication uh, is open access 
not because it's actually free, but because the producers of the research have to contribute uh, to pay to be published. Um, and that has led to the proliferation of what I can politely call bogus academic journals, uh, who uh, continually say, uh, publish with us, publish with us. And uh, of course, if one is careful, one doesn't. So I, I agree with what Honora said, but I, I, think, I think that open access is terrific. And um, I think, for, I mean, I was at MIT for nine years before coming um, to Cambridge, and I think their open courseware is a really amazing resource. That's where all of uh, the, re the teaching uh, is online. There's, there's good yeah. stuff that is online yeah. and available, but yeah. there's also a tremendous incentive for people to try to flood in with other stuff. And uh, the, uh, I'm sure that you too, Ray, get an enormous number of emails from bogus journals that want you to contribute to them, them, them. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure we all have things about our email that we <laughs> uh, that we don't like and don't want to talk about right now. But in, in terms of the, the democratizing of knowledge, I do think open access is part of it, but it's nowhere near enough because there's so much more. If you're going to talk about the do democratization of knowledge, it takes so much knowledge in order to get more knowledge. So, you know, most of us can't understand most of what's in other disciplines' journals. Um, and um, so there's going to be, there's, there's going to be, you know, you know, walls and corrals that, that wall people out. Um, I think it's a good question. Um, and I don't have all the answers. No, nor do I. I'm, and uh, I think that, uh, the fact that there are bogus journals may be the price we have to pay for the, the benefits of open access. But I do note that uh, if one wanted a model for something that's open access and I think has been very beneficial, it happens to be a not-for-profit, Wikipedia. Very good thought. And then one, well, two very good questions, but going to the same end, which is, I think there's been a suggestion in what we've been saying that some sort of regulation is needed, some sort of standards, but how does one do that across geographical borders? Who do we trust to do it, given that we know that there are some countries who already regulate the internet mm. with exactly the same purposes of restricting access to Indeed. divergent views, um, which is why I think certainly when I was in uh, UK civil service, the UK government always held out against efforts to regulate the internet just because how did you do it in a way that wasn't counterproductive? But do you have any thoughts about who might be trusted to do that at world level? Well, I, I have a certain amount of uh, interest in antitrust action. That is to say, I think that the um, uh, degree to which the various big tech companies monopolize certain areas is something that where we could take action and most people would in the past have seen that as democratically very desirable action. So if we go back to the early 20th century and we think about antitrust action against General Motors or Big Oil, um, that was on the whole desirable. Now, uh, of course, knowledge is a different thing from oil and cars, but all the same, I think that that is a, a direction of reg, uh, in which there could be some regulation which might be a desirable thing. It will at least enable one to say, here are the better sources uh, that, could, uh, that would perhaps begin to be some public view uh, that uh, these or those were quite trustworthy and those others perhaps less so. So I think it's not it's not the case that we don't have regulation anyway. Uh, so we, there is a huge, well, there are many laws that regulate what you can say, whether on the internet or not. So um, if we think of speech as a matter of doing things with words, as a matter of speech acts, 
Um, there are many speech acts uh, that we, that, I mean, so pharmaceutical companies aren't allowed to put out false advertising. Um, there are all kinds of things that are disallowed. Um, there's uh, child pornography is, is not allowed. Um, um, and so um, whatever, um, so, so the, the question is, and I agree that, that there are, that it, it's a really important question about how uh, we go about this. But it's, um, I, I mean, one thing that uh, came out of the um, Leveson inquiry was that I was the importance of an independent, um, was the, the idea of an independent, if you like, intermediary on the intermediaries, um, if I can put it that way, Nora. Um, but of course, that was for the world of print. Yeah, that was for the world of print. So, um, so is there a way of um, holding so you, you hold publishers, publishers are held responsible. Yes. Is there any mileage in the idea that, uh, I, I know that, that, that many European countries, um, many countries are, are saying, well, look, there's a sense in which um, tech companies are not so much like the postal service, which never looks inside your envelope. They're much more like a publisher. So, uh, so is there any mileage in that thought? Well, a lot of people have argued that, and some people think it can't be done, uh, but uh, I think that is the route one would have to go, and then there would have to be an imprint um, that would tell you, as it were, who was the author of this, who was the author of that. And I think that would produce a very considerable change in behaviour. Uh, um, I hope that you're not all of you hearing this dog. <laughs> Are, are you all can, hearing the dog? I can hear your dog. <laughs> In which case, I will absent myself for 10 seconds. No, the, the, the well, dog Nora, Nora, Nora we, we need to come to a close anyway. Okay. So I think your, your dog has just been doing the countdown for us. And I think we all know that one of the, uh, again, joys of doing things on Zoom is the insights we get into people's lives, which we wouldn't have got if you were sitting in, well, um, well, in, in a room. Yes. And so well. I, I don't have small children running in, but I do no. have this, someone let the dog into my room. <laughs> so as, in sympathy with the dog, who clearly feels we've had far too much of your attention for far too long, um, and as uh, we did promise our listeners that we would we would finish in an hour, um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you, and I'm sure all the listeners are very sad that they can't applaud you in the normal way. They just have to allow me to do a sort of silent applaud so that I don't deafen you. Um, but I think it's been an absolutely wonderful conversation. Thank you particularly to uh, all the listeners who've, I think, really added to that conversation and taken us in some very interesting directions. So um, thank you very much indeed for making such a success of our first uh, digital conversation and it's uh, um, a big step for us because uh, as some of you will know uh, Nunum is coming up to celebrating its 150th anniversary and because of Covid times we're going to be doing a lot more of our celebrations digitally um, so it's a tremendous encouragement to me to see how engaged people can become on the internet and I think Ray and Nora almost aren't aware of the of, of the format because they've just got so engaged and also sucked us in to eavesdropping on this amazing conversation. So you've got people thinking and some of them are now saying thank you very much. So that's thank absolutely you. great. So thank, thank, you, thank you. you everyone. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Alison. And have a good evening, everybody. Good night.